first off, thank you, Mike, and everyone who put this organization together. Um, really happy to be here. Uh, I was originally met Mike at B-Sides Orlando online, but we met up at B-Sides and he kept proposing the idea that I speak. So thank you to him. I didn't put it in the presentation, but usually I do thank everyone who does join and um, stuff like that to actually attend my talk. And this talk today, what we're going to be going over is automotive cybersecurity. A pretty touchy topic today, actually. Um, pretty uh, expanding too. So I just thought I'd put a little presentation together going over the field and exactly you know what it contains and so on from there. So without much more to say, I can actually go ahead and step into this. So first off, like to uh, mention that there is going to be some slides that go dark and then light. So if you are in a dark room, prepare for the light mode to just flash randomly. And I will warn you beforehand before those slides, uh, if I can. Uh, so let me actually, yeah, right. So about this presentation. So this presentation is again on automotive cybersecurity, and we're going to go over a decent amount of, uh, well, hidden chunk of data um, and information. For example, like what is automotive cybersecurity, why it exists, some of the models, some companies and corporations and stuff that are actively in the field and are helping, how automobiles network and a lot of common attacks and attack surfaces on modern day vehicles. That is actually the point of this presentation is modern day vehicles. Uh, so we won't really be going over vehicles from early 2000s or anything, mostly targeting vehicles like Teslas and other things like that, kind of explaining their modern attack surfaces. Of course, we'll go into how hackers even begin to start practicing with car hacking and uh, different technologies and stuff like that, just to give you an outline. Uh, so this right here is all the stuff that we're going to be doing. Moving like right into it, I'd like to introduce myself a little bit. So my name is Ryan. My online name is totally not a hacker. Uh, ironic. <laughs> uh, I am a 16-year-old cybersecurity researcher who currently works at a company called Block Harbor Cybersecurity, who aim um, to progress in the automotive cybersecurity world by building great solutions to keep um, not only growing the automotive industry, but also keep our industry safe. Um, I've done a lot of talks and been on a lot of uh, different groups and podcasts and stuff where I do explain anything from automotive cybersecurity to aerospace and uh, other fields like that. I've written a few books here and there, uh, still working on a few others. And I'm also a developer, so I spend a lot of my time writing exploits, either for games or uh, for binary applications, whatever I can see fit. Um, and of course, I also have a lot of time where I spend in communities, uh, primarily because I don't believe that putting a price tag on specific sets of knowledge like this is um, needed because I think everyone should give the ability to learn something at least for free. That being said, pretty much just enough about me. Uh, there's more, you know, if you want to know about me, you can ask at the end. And before we start the presentation, I would please ask that most people do keep their microphones you know, muted unless you are an admin or have something to interject and say as a moderator. Uh, just to keep everything quiet and to make sure no distractions or anything is um, done. Without much more to say, let's get into it. Uh, so the first slide I have uh, is actually going to be talking about uh, what our agenda is, the point in this presentation. So the reason I originally developed this presentation was to introduce people to the modern day attack surfaces of vehicles, get people into this uh, industry, which has a lot of people, but not enough people, especially with how fast it's growing. And also to help people get a good like start into this industry, making sure they at least have a good foundation of knowledge and resources on where to go into this industry. Uh, of course, we will go over that at the end. And moving directly into it, I, we can start off with what is automotive cybersecurity. So automotive cybersecurity is the research of individual components or specifically security research of individual components within vehicles. Uh, modern day vehicles are becoming very, very advanced. Uh, lots of different technologies, Wi-Fi networks, cellular networks, Bluetooth networks, and a million different things. In order to make sure that users and drivers remain secure, we need to also do uh, security auditing and many different security tests on these components within these vehicles. Uh, some of the modules may be uh, also known as electrical control units and different physical boards on the car, especially because cars are just basically giant smartphones um, now. And it kind of involves uh, not just auditing of the vehicle itself, but maybe even touching on some of the third party services that vehicles use, because vehicle uh, engineers don't always just stick to themselves. They obviously outsource from many other different companies. And because of that, we need to test those components as well that belong to those companies. Um, so that's pretty much just a rundown of what it is. Uh, there's much more that goes into it, as you will see throughout this uh, presentation. And now we can actually move on to why it exists. So here I have a ton, like a, a decent amount of uh, security reports or uh, how do I say them? Uh, 
case studies from researchers who have either recently been able to gain vulnerabilities or sorry, exploit vulnerabilities on vehicles or uh, been able in the past to manipulate vehicles. So there's two case studies I'd like to mention here, one by a security researcher called Sam Curry, who was able to pretty much reverse engineer an application and manipulate the uh, application programming interface that connected remotely to the car and was able to remotely control or execute functions on the vehicle itself through the application by bypassing specific authentication methods. Whole story on it, uh, and I can definitely link that at the end of this. And of course, the um, other one by Fortune Mag right here by Teen Hacker says he's found a way to remotely control 25 Teslas. Uh, this was through exploiting a vulnerability in third party software that Tesla used. Um, and he was able to mess with the functions inside of the car, such as the environmental controls or even sound and speakers and a whole bunch of other things. Automotive cybersecurity is important exactly because of this. We got to consider the fact that most vehicles are four, eight tons. And if we're throwing electrical systems in there and just putting them on the internet, um, as we have with smart TVs and toasters and even appliances in our kitchen, then it's important we secure it, especially if we consider the fact that if someone is able to remotely control a vehicle, especially with a small piece of information and can remotely control any specific vehicle a part of that model, then it's important that we understand that that can result in deadly um, deadly consequences per se, uh, such as remote shutdown of the vehicle, you know, uh, the brakes ended up or uh, transmission dropping even on a more wider scale. Uh, there's many different case studies out there, specifically the one in 2014 stands out the most because it helped boost automotive cybersecurity. Uh, in 2014, hackers were able to remotely kill a Jeep. Uh, they did this through exploiting uh, one of the units in the vehicles where they were able to remotely control some of the functions in the vehicles. And a lot of this, uh, theoretically, um, and in, even as they showed in the research, was could have ended deadly. Um, there's a lot more other case studies out there, especially when it comes to the hardware components in vehicles and even the software components specifically. Uh, keep in mind that a lot of security researchers will be finding bugs on the like low hanging fruit level. So a lot of stuff that would be easier for a regular hacker to exploit, something like uh, just out of bounds, like cross site scripting. Uh, or even some API vulnerabilities that allow you to execute functions on a vehicle remotely without authentication. Just some good examples to throw out there for now. Moving forward, I would like to get into a few um, things about who is already helping out in this field. So we couldn't really have gotten as far as we have without a lot of companies, corporations, or organizations coming together to proof with a lot of research or to even create events to burst out the idea of automotive cybersecurity. What I mean by that is by reaching out, you know, doing presentations such as this one or talks or even proving their research and showing people that this is something that we should actually not be scared of, but definitely be looking out for. So some of the organizations you're going to see throughout this um, presentation is going to be uh, Block Harbor, Automotive Security Research Group, and Vic One. Uh, all these automotive security research group, for one, is a uh, research community uh, dedicated to automotive cybersecurity. There's a lot of people involved in that group and a lot of people um, who present and talk for them. And they basically host these online webinars and stuff that we will get into at the end of the presentation as well. And companies like Block Harbor Cybersecurity, which is my company, or not my company, but the company I work for, um, and they have started to help out in this fight and uh, in the fight to secure vehicles by providing educational platforms and even CTF challenges that can remotely connect to vehicles and stuff that they own and they do test. Um, so just a good example of how a lot of people do it. Some companies like Block Harbor Cybersecurity will collaborate with other companies such as Vic One to either push out new content, push out new platforms, or help um, push out new ideas and research for vehicles, especially when they can join a lot of their resources together and help give education or maybe training and even give contributions to the community as a whole. Um, this is important because not just the outreach it gets, but also the fact that, you know, joining forces is probably the best thing in an industry that is as competitive as automotive cybersecurity can be, uh, especially when you have a bunch of people that are just racing to find bugs and then people that actually want to take the time and care for these bugs and actually fix them and then find anything that's branching off from them. Moving forward, I actually just want to hop straight into this. Uh, this will give you more context throughout the presentation. Automobiles today are just clusters of web systems, network systems, and all these different communication systems. Uh, in order for a lot of these systems to work, there's uh, such thing as automotive protocols. In, in standard Wi-Fi routers, we use many different protocols and communication protocols for computers to interact with the world around it. Uh, in automotive, we have the same exact thing. 
one of the most common protocols is also known as uh, controller area network or CAN. Um, it's a pretty, pretty familiar protocol. Uh, now we use a protocol called CAN-FD, which is a much more faster and uh, resilient protocol than the classical CAN is. But regardless, protocols like CAN are used in vehicles for whether it be diagnostics or uh, communication systems or whatever it may be that the vehicle needs to connect internally. Uh, on the inside of the vehicle, just basically breaking it down, uh, these protocols are pretty much there to help modules known as electrical control units um, or electrical control modules, depending on the context, communicate with each other. Because back then, cars were all hardwired together and every single unit had to be hardwired. But in today's world, we don't need that. Uh, we can just have one single or two, in this case, two wires running through different units and stuff and communicating back and forth. Um, whole different engineering perspective, but just to give you a perspective on uh, how automobiles work a little bit in today's world. Um, we also have other protocols called FlexRay, Most Local Interconnected Network, or also LIN, Automotive Ethernet, which is just a Ethernet version tailored towards automotive specific tasks, controller area network, um, flexible data rate. So CAN FD, which is the more advanced version of CAN we use now. And of course, some companies even go as far as building their own custom implementations. Not that it's safe, but they do it anyway, uh, because why not? Um, all these protocols can also be used in conjunction with each other, where they help uh, the systems overall communicate. Uh, FlexRay is a more stronger protocol, so it would be used for uh, tasks in a vehicle that are, are more data reliant, uh, which means they need data really fast and they might need heavier loads of data. Meanwhile, you have smaller protocols like Local Interconnected Network or LIN, which are going to be used for smaller tasks, uh, tasks that are more lightweight and um, stuff like that. There's a million different road paths you can go down with different protocols. And the last one I can go over is most. Uh, this is a media-based protocol. So this is used uh, commonly uh, for video transmission, audio transmission, or streaming and other data transmission within units of vehicles. All these protocols work. Um, most, most vehicles, at least today, use multiple protocols, multiple types of these protocols and other protocols out there to help make the system much more um, faster or I guess you can also say, I'm trying to find a good word for it, but I can also say resilient in terms of communication, where it's much more resistant towards faults or so on from there, which is where the choice and protocol comes into play. Uh, pretty much just why I wanted to get into this a little bit, just giving you a context of what to look into. And you're going to see some of these protocols pop up a lot. And I even have a cool case study to show on one of these protocols later on. But for now, just to give you a base, we can go ahead and move on further. Then this is the light bomb and flashbang that I was talking about. So excuse the uh, very bright and uh, the, the annoying uh, slide. Um, so this slide is talking about modern attack surfaces. In today's cars, there are a ton and ton of plausible entry points for data in a vehicle, which of course gives it a larger attack surface. Um, many of the things include uh, some of the radio communications. I'm not sure if you guys are all familiar, but uh, I'm sure we've all every once in a while seen a flipper zero being used against a Tesla. That's an example of one of the very many, many attack surface or sorry, attack vectors that exist in a vehicle today on the radio communication side. But of course, there's way more than that, such as the APIs used in vehicles or the monitoring systems or the user management, feature management, and even infotainment systems that exist within vehicles. Um, every single part of these all include their uh, unique little uh, systems that can either be reverse engineered or exploited in some shape or form. Uh, from what I've seen, a lot of people are starting to target the infotainment units uh, in vehicles, which are pretty much just like giant iPads. This is because they can't contain a lot of different modules. Uh, I'm trying to think of the other word. Uh, even communications such as Wi-Fi networks and Bluetooth networks and stuff that exists within that unit. Uh, even feature management and user management for the vehicle itself. And that leaves a lot of endpoints. Also considering that modern day infotainment units also uh, outreach external to the vehicle, which means maybe remote servers or something like that, or they can, uh, for example. So that's just an example of like some of the modern attack surfaces we have. There's a lot more, but this is a good outline to say, you know, this is a baseline to what most vehicles are probably going to have in them, say from, I don't know, I'm trying to think like 2018 and up. Of course, I can't pinpoint a specific year, but just a good, you know, range of years for these systems that will be included in these vehicles. Uh, all of them can be targeted in different ways too. And all of them will, I mean, the results of the exploit could be different depending on what that system is tied to. And all of them are tied to different systems in the vehicle. So just an um, important note on that. 
Uh, so moving forward, why would we even target automobiles? This is a question I get a lot. <laughs> um, some people don't quite understand why vehicles would be targeted. Like why would a hacker want to just target a random vehicle? Uh, the first thing I, on the good side, at least that I can know is just because it's pretty cool. Um, this of course is not a 100% validated uh, reason, but it is pretty cool and genuinely interesting to hack a car and be able to remotely control it. I think it's pretty interesting. I think a lot of other people do too. But of course, the other two aspects on the good side and two out of many aspects is going to be research and saving lives for a better, more stronger and secure future. I just read an article uh, or a small little snippet of a collaboration between uh, OpenAI and Mercedes, which I just mentioned at the beginning here. Um, and, and that's a good example of where cars are heading. If we are still having common vulnerabilities being exploited in vehicles, I don't think we should really uh, just slack back and just let it all happen. You know, we need to be researching and to build a better future, to give people a good idea of where our cars are heading, especially if we're already starting to merge um, AI like ChatGPT into vehicles, especially luxury vehicles like Mercedes. Those cars can be pretty expensive depending on the brand or not the brand, but the model of the vehicle. Plus it's super fun and there's a lot of great learning in it. Automotive cybersecurity contains many different fields of cybersecurity. You've got reverse engineering, firmware analysis, binary analysis, uh, even down into uh, web hacking, uh, as far as what I've seen, uh, API security testing and Wi-Fi hacking, radio communications, and so on from there that all make it a really, really great field and an energetic field to get into. I mean, I think it's pretty badass to tell your friends, you know, like I was able to hack a car. But of course, you know, again, there's more to that than that. Uh, more to automotive cybersecurity than just that. Uh, and the public educational aspect is pretty cool. I spent a few times trying to educate people publicly that aren't in cybersecurity or aren't aware that cybersecurity exists. It's a bit of a mess uh, to explain and, and some people actually get genuinely frightened, but our aim is to properly deliver the knowledge to people that may not understand to make more people aware and instead of scared, aware. That That's literally just it. Make them so aware that they can at least you know, maybe update the software of their vehicle every once in a while, especially when a vehicle's software is outdated and is remotely exploitable. That's a good start. Now, moving forward, you also have the bad side. There's a lot of people that want to, um, and thankfully have not yet, exploited a car for any bad natures. Uh, but there are a ton of natures um, or reasons as to why someone would hack a car. One of the good examples of this is going to be looking into the Kia boys, which are a bunch of... Um, there are a group of little kids, I believe, in Chicago that spend their time uh, exploiting a vulnerability in the key fob. I think the key fob systems of Kias, uh, and they basically steal the cars and they break into them. They either sell them or they go wreck havoc. I mean, there's some interesting videos that you can Google about them. I forgot exactly, but that's a good example of just people that want to wreck havoc. Maybe personal gang or even remote theft. There's a lot of people that might want to be breaking into vehicles to steal them and go sell them. but for particular, uh, in particular for specific parts. Um, that all depends. Uh, there's been, a, like I said, a few very minimal cases, nothing too damaging yet, but there is definitely some good um, uh, videos out there that showcase you know, car hacking being used for bad. But there is one common thing between the good and the bad, vehicular modification. If you think about it, vehicles are becoming more and more secure, which also means that the developers and the people who manufacture the cars are locking vehicles down. Just like a Tesla, for example, I believe to replace the tires on a Tesla in specific models, you have to take them to a dealership um, just to make sure that nothing happens and you don't brick your Tesla. I believe there's, I think, um, probably more to look into there. But just an example of like dealership specific vehicles for maintenance where you can't take them to regular garages because they need developers there or someone to unlock the vehicle to tell the vehicle, hey, this is a legitimate developer and not someone trying to hack the vehicle uh, or sorry, break it. Um, but if you can learn how to hack cars, there's a lot of tuning and stuff you can do to vehicles. From what I've seen, a lot of people can make electronic modifications that are pretty, pretty cool, um, especially for people who are using a car or drivers and stuff like that. But just one common thing between there. So with that, in summary, there's a lot of reasons why we want to target vehicles. But of course, hopefully, most people are going to be targeting it for the good reasons and not the bad reasons. We don't want to be um, driving a car around that we stole remotely. But of course, there's always going to be people out there. Moving forward, I also have a slide called How Us Nerds Practice, which is like how people like me uh, who are in the cybersecurity world for automobiles or how other people, even the bad people, may practice. 
there is a lot of different systems and a lot of different toolkits and stuff that you can use out there. And of course, people can like rip infotainment units out of consoles now if they go to a junkyard and they can start testing on this. But some good examples I have kind of separate into two categories, software and hardware. Uh, software is obviously going to be your network simulators for your like Wi-Fi network hacking, uh, firmware emulators if you're trying to practice reverse engineering firmware or um, breaking firmware, whatever it may be. And of course, you even have, if you extend network simulations, uh, operating systems like Linux have great support for protocols like controller area network, which allow you to mimic those networks in a real like environment of what a car would be talking about. And you can practice reverse engineering. It. There's a framework out there or not a framework, but it's a simulator called Instrument Cluster Simulator by Zombie Craig or Craig Smith. Uh, it's also known as IC Sim. Uh, and it's a simulator that's used a lot, uh, even today, to get people into the idea of reverse engineering networks of vehicles. Now, it's a lot more complex to do that because there's a lot of security mechanisms that prevent us from uh, reverse engineering the networks of cars. But of course, it's a good entry point level, uh, or at least, again, entry point into automotive cybersecurity and the physical aspects of it. And of course, we have the hardware side, specific you know, chips you can practice on. Uh, this is a whole hardware hacking field. Uh, physical analyzers, for, like chip analyzers or chemical stations. This was an interesting one. And it's something I have yet to be used in the automotive cybersecurity world that I have seen, but I've seen it outside of this and in the field of hardware hacking. So there's this cool little uh, concept, which I won't go too deep into because it is a very long concept, but I suggest you guys look into it. Uh, called invasive fault injection. And it basically requires basically physically reverse engineering a chip uh, using chemicals like acetone to melt away the silicone layers of the chip. Uh, this can be used for further analysis. Uh, granted, you do ruin the chip, so you can't like plug it back in and just expect it to work. But if you are working with a very specific model of chips for that manufacturer, then that can become helpful. I saw this done on a college lecture like once, um, but it was just cool to bring up because I thought, you know, the idea of this by physically analyzing the boards in a vehicle would be pretty good to point out. Of course, you also have uh, signal injectors, which are going to be like your um, trying to think like your software defined radios that can replay signals back to a car. Uh, signal interceptors, which can listen, intercept, and decode signals. And of course, wireless decoders, which are going to be more or less your like network attacks and stuff like that on vehicles. Of course, sniffing utilities, SDRs, and other various systems that pretty much just fell into what we just listed. Yeah, um, that's pretty much how we can practice. It can be anything from simulators to basic security testing and understanding. Uh, because vehicles have all these complex systems, and because now we're transitioning into a world of cars that have Wi-Fi networks and Bluetooth networks and stuff, uh, and actually, sorry, extending more, because we've already been here since like 2014, um, the practice becomes pretty much just like practicing basic cybersecurity, really. Uh, or exploits and stuff like that. So yeah, uh, it's a good example of how we practice. Now, what about web? So I've already mentioned web uh, decently in vehicles, but I never explained why they exist. So a lot of people bring up the idea, well, that's dumb. Why would you make a, a vehicle, attach it to the, you know, the internet? And there's a lot of reasons why we might do this, uh, specifically because it's much easier to manage like vehicle features, uh, especially because you can connect it to an app as we've seen with like the Tesla apps. And I think BMW even has an app for their vehicles that can remotely um, transfer and change data within the vehicle. It's much more performant and lightweight, especially on the development process and developing a whole bunch of other internal networks for it. Of course, that's a whole engineering uh, perspective and I am not a automotive engineer, so I'm not qualified to speak on that. But I will still say that it's uh, it's a lot harder to do it inside the vehicle than it is outside the vehicle. Uh, regardless, I mean, you're still communicating with the internal um, or internals of the vehicle, but it takes and adds so much more to the vehicle when you have it remote. Um, also, there's many different things like being chained together easily. If you think about the world of APIs and how APIs work in web systems, you would understand that you can chain APIs together relatively easy. And if you can do that throughout an entire vehicle network, then it just makes everything a million times more easier. You may commonly see web systems and infotainment systems or the applications like the one that Sam Curry was able to attack and reverse engineer or at least inspect. I can't say fully reverse engineer, but I'll just keep that term there. Uh, also for self-driving, uh, the Tesla app is a great example of the remote keying uh, for self-driving a Tesla or like self-parking it, I believe. I'm not sure if they've removed that feature, but I do remember seeing it like a year back or something like that. 
I haven't kept up on Teslas in a bit, but just an example of where webs also might come in handy with vehicles. So now there's some, some things that I still like automotive engineering. I can't be fully qualified to speak, but I'd rather bring up. So when we start manufacturing vehicles, some people may think by based on the vulnerabilities that are being found and exploited that there is no form of uh, regulations or rules or anything during the engineering process. But the truth is, is that there is a decent, I'm saying decent as in it's good enough for now, um, of regulation standards and even frameworks and, and management systems to protect our vehicles. Um, one of the most common one is the ISO 21434. Uh, that standard is actually pretty popular and believe that it lasts throughout the entire lifetime of the engineering development uh, behind or product development of the vehicle. Uh, it defines all these different systems and different um, core concepts or sorry, not concepts. I guess you can say processes uh, for managing different thing of the word. Can't coin it vulnerabilities or weaknesses. Um, there, there's a million different ways I can't like I'm trying to coin it, but I can't exactly. Regardless, the standards are here to help protect our vehicles by lasting throughout most of the lifetime or the entire lifetime of the vehicle development or product development life cycle. Um, this helps by making sure that, you know, obviously vulnerabilities and random stuff isn't just left open during the product, like production of the actual uh, vehicle itself. Uh, a lot of systems exist to uh, assign specific tasks, such as the cybersecurity management system. And if you're already in the governance world or the regulations world and engineering world period in uh, information security, then the ISMS or information security management system is another one. Even for software updates also have their own management system. And that system is the software update management system. All these systems also help uh, manage specific tasks and duties during that development process of the vehicle. And like the standards, we also have like regulations that must be followed. I definitely recommend, and I'll try to post some links at the end, and I can ask for further questions on this, but um, these standards, regulations, and systems are definitely important to get into. Uh, it's worth knowing, at least so you understand what uh, companies are working out for and the efforts that they're trying to, to implement uh, when they're reaching vehicles, uh, or at least, sorry, building vehicles and throwing them into production. Moving forward, actually, I believe, this next slide. Yeah. So. I've already defined a little bit about uh, some of the vehicle hackers and what they've done. Most of the research that we see pop up is just like um, a gray hat hacker just randomly hacking a vehicle for fun or boredom, or maybe he just came across something in his own vehicle that he decided he'd explore. Well, at companies like Block Harbor, we have many different um, uh, labs and uh, buildings for testing vehicles ethically. Of course, we follow guidelines and different rules and regulations, but I thought I'd dedicate this slide a little bit to explaining some of the operations and even the laboratories we have, such as the vehicle security uh, labs for testing vehicles. Uh, in these labs, we have different procedures, uh, such as, you know, what state the vehicle has to be in or I'm trying to think of the term, but pretty much like making sure the vehicle isn't touching the ground or the wheels can't be just drive um, or are touching the ground per se. I guess that's a way to put it. Um, because when testing a vehicle, we don't wanna accidentally trigger a function that tells the car, hey, let's just go forward or go backwards, left, right, whatever it may be. And then we end up driving a vehicle in a building through a wall. Uh, so there's a lot of security practices and stuff, especially when it comes to protecting the lab's internals uh, as far as um, ethically testing vehicles goes. Reason we want to protect against this is at least make sure that not any random outsider is just walking into our labs and touching stuff. So we also have our own rules and regulations for those labs to even be constructed. Uh, we also have vehicle security operations, um, also known as VSO. Uh, th these people are dedicated towards incidents response, status reporting, and even process automation throughout uh, testing the vehicle. Uh, depends on the company, but um, mainly vehicle security operations is that a lot of incident response, um, say with platforms like Splunk, uh, and status reporting with other reporting tools and stuff like that. Basically, these facilities and these labs and even systems and uh, sets of operations, there is more. Um, but these two here specifically work in conjunction to ethically test vehicles and throw them through the process. A lot of this can be in penetration testing or even fuzzing specific components in the vehicle. Just giving you a good outline of, you know, hey, we're not just taking a uh, car on the street and just letting it drive and then just testing it actively. There is a step in process in which a lot of companies will be doing this uh, just for sakes. Um, so, yeah, uh, that's 
our facilities and labs. And of course, we are reaching the end of this presentation. So I thought I'd also dedicate a slide to a little bit on, you know, why automotive cybersecurity is important and personally where it reaches into me. I always tell people that there's many different reasons as to why automotive cybersecurity exists. One, it's super cool. And then the other time it's like a, a serious job. Uh, we want to make sure vehicles are safe. We are in 2023. Uh, we have APIs and vehicles, and yet indirect object reference is still one of the most obvious findings to find in APIs today. Um, I just recently located one on an IoT device. It's a, it's a massive, massive problem uh, with our security. We're innovating too much, I guess I can say, and not securing fast enough. Um, so with the constant growing rate of innovation and creation of different vehicles and stuff, it it really becomes important that we protect it. Uh, but there are many reasons, uh, or sorry, not reasons, ways that you can also help out. You can start your own research, make presentations, uh, help push out new content for automotive cybersecurity, really get the word out there. And maybe even um, trying to think if there's like going to spaces like this um, or DEF CON groups, or even attending places like the Car Hacking Village or many different automotive rounded events that can help you grow your knowledge in this field to help you also contribute better, such as contributing your knowledge or research or time. Um, all in all, there's a lot of other things that companies could be doing, but other companies don't, and I won't name because I don't want that to be a actual problem. Um, but yeah. So there's many things that we can be doing and we should be doing, and we are, uh, especially in this community here in the automotive cybersecurity community and what we're doing. So just pretty much ending, ending on that um, for this slide, at least. Um, speaking of events, I thought I would take uh, a little moment to address some of the really, really cool events that exist here. DEF CON Car Hacking Village is an obvious one. That's been around for quite a while. But if you guys don't know, DEF CON, I'm pretty sure every time now, has their Car Hacking Village, which is set up by many different people. Um, we have the Automotive Security Research Group, the webinars, as I mentioned. Uh, their website, you can literally Google ASRG or Automotive Cybersecurity Research Group, and you can log into their website or sign up on their website and see all their webinars that they do. They also have a YouTube channel where I believe they post some of the recordings there. Um, Pawn to Own is, I believe, new this year, uh, but they just recently passed it. But they now started an automotive sector for automotive cybersecurity. And of course, the Automotive ISAC Cybersecurity Summit is a pretty big one. I sadly wasn't able to go to this one, but from what I hear, it's really, really worth the time. Uh, and of course, I, I have to bring up the company. Block Harbor Cybersecurity, uh, that company also does a lot of CTFs here recently, like we just hosted the... Um, hackathon and they i believe they went to gurkhan I, I can't remember where they went but they also did their own ctfs hosting and stuff there that really helped grow people's knowledge in automotive cybersecurity, and at least i believe even got people to know that this field actually exists because surprisingly enough not a lot of people know this field exists um so that's pretty much it for events uh I'm, there's more events out there i believe even some b-sides uh, events in the us or around the world also have car hacking villages and stuff set up and that's all worth looking into uh, but for now these are just some basic ones here make sure i'm at the end right so we have reached the end of the presentation um if you want to connect with me on linkedin ryan marston is my name i wasn't sure if i fully clarified that i have an instagram and i also write blogs on platforms like medium there's Many other links you can find, and at best, you can put OSINT skills definitely to the top of your list um, and find me on a lot of other platforms. So that being said, we can go ahead and ask questions. And once again, I'd like to thank the organizers of this event. E events, I guess I can call it. Yeah, I can call it an event. Um, event for having me here. And also thank you to Mike for pulling me on a little bit earlier. Mm -hmm.